Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this week's session we will be covering an introduction, overview, and uh, orientation to qualitative interviewing. So, you've heard about interviews being a key technique in qualitative data collection. So why do we interview? Interviews are a very common way of capturing data in qualitative research. We use interviews to explore a question or issue in depth with key informants who have first-hand, professional, or other kinds of relevant experience and knowledge about the issue. Um, and we typically use interviews uh, because they're exploratory and open-ended. So we use them because we have some key broad questions and areas of inquiry that we want to explore, but we also want to gauge in dialogue. Um, so we don't have firm and specific questions, we have broader open-ended questions and we want to leave space for new and surprising things to come up. So interviews are a way of finding out about how others feel about an experience or an issue and they are an attempt to understand the world from the participant's point of view or the interviewee's point of view. Qualitative interviews are very useful for exploring why a respondent behaves in a certain way or what they think about a certain issue. Um, so exploring the meaning or uh, the understanding that they bring to the questions and getting the stories behind their experiences. And qualitative interviews are very good for understanding the why and how questions that we're interested in in qualitative research. They are not good for specific fact finding or getting answers to questions of how much and how many that is typically the domain of quantitative research and in particular surveys. So why would we use an interview versus a survey? So as I just said, interviews are exploring open-ended and multifaceted questions. Surveys, on the other hand, have a fixed set of specific questions and so they're better for ask, answering these how many and how much questions. We may use qualitative interviews to follow up on answers we get in surveys. So sometimes we will do surveys and then we'll use an interview to delve deeper into the yes or no questions that we've asked on the survey. And so we can actually get into the reasons behind the answers. So sometimes they're used uh, in, in tandem with one another, but they, are, as we've discussed previously, they answer different questions. So interviews are usually very open-ended and they seek to go deep. The respondent answers in their own words and the questions are flexible and adaptable. So we can reword the questions, we can jump around in relation to the questions, we don't have to ask them in a specific order um, and that's how they're adaptable. Interviews are good for when you don't know how people will respond, um, you're trying to really explore something. Um, in interviews you were in direct discussion so you have the ability to probe, to follow up, to clarify responses. Interviews, however, are more demanding and time-consuming, and so they're, they're impractical if you're looking for large, large numbers of respondents. And interviews also require skill to conduct, and they are harder to categorize, analyze, and interpret. Surveys are better for close-ended questions that seek to go wide and that seek to gain insights or gain responses across large numbers of people. So surveys are less time consuming for respondents. Um, usually uh, an interview takes at least an hour. Surveys are often uh, uh, 20 minutes max. Uh, so surveys typically result in higher response rates. Um, and survey data is either easier to categorize, it's often quantitative um, and is done using software. Um, so it's easier to categorize, analyze and interpret. Uh, surveys, however, can lead to oversimplification or assumptions about the questions under investigation because we don't have the opportunity, we're not having this dialogue, we're not conducting this in a, in a real time when we can ask questions, probe deeper, we're on not in direct discussion. Um, so that's why surveys can sometimes lead to limited data or data that is prone to oversimplification or assumptions. In qualitative research, we identify three types of interviews. Unstructured interviews are the most informal and exploratory type of interview. In an unstructured interview, there are no or maybe just one predetermined question. Um, and this is in order to remain as open and as adaptable as possible. So uh, in this interview, we're really interested in being, uh, you know, in being very, very exploratory and exploring the interviewee's needs and priorities. So during this interview, the interviewer goes with the flow and doesn't have any really uh, predetermined questions or very, very few. In the semi-structured interview, 
they're more structured. So it's not, uh, it's not completely unstructured. You do have a guide. You do have general questions that you want to answer. And this guide provides for focus and adaptability. So it, it provides you a focus, but it's also something that you can adapt. And so in the semi-structured interview guide, there are specific topic areas that you want to explore. And there's a general set of questions. But the interview flows like a conversation. And the topics are covered as they come up. So the guide, the guide allows for a degree of freedom and adaptability in getting the information. Um, and so it is structured, but it is not a very firm structure. And you can play with this structure and create a dialogue out of it. In standardized or very structured interviews, these are the least adaptable. In a standardized interview, the same questions are asked in the same order to every interviewee. Um, so you have a very structured guide and you follow it completely and you don't deviate or adapt upon it. So this approach um, facilitates a faster interview um, and it's typically more easily analyzed and compared because you're putting things into very specific um, predetermined boxes. So for your interview assignments, um, which you know is uh, going to be an assignment that uh, you're going to conduct and is due in February, uh, you will find a peer to interview and you will have a discussion and chat with them. And the main focus of this interview will be to explore what does environmental activism mean to EUC students. So that's the broad uh, perspective that you want to get at with this interview and you want to delve into with uh, a peer uh, in your cohort or in, your, in, your, um, uh, in environmental studies, uh, what this means to them, why they chose this area of study and, uh, and really why um, and what um, environmental activism means to them. So this assignment, you will be interviewing another student and you'll be transcribing the interview, and then you'll be writing a personal reflection on the interview. So this is an individual assignment. You will work together in pairs to do the interview, or you will be interviewing one of your fellow students, um, but your transcript and your reflection paper is an individual paper. So everybody has to conduct an interview, and then transcribe that interview, write a personal individual reflection on the interview, um, which is a reflection paper. Then we will make these transcripts available to the whole class. We will anonymize the transcripts and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in a future session. So we'll make sure that there's no names or identifying materials in the transcripts. Then we will put the transcripts up onto a Google Drive folder that's accessible to everybody in the class. And you will use this as a database to analyze for your final assignment, which is the analysis assignment. So you will identify several transcripts uh, in this folder. You don't have to analyze all of them. Of course, there's going to be many transcripts, but you have to identify a handful of transcripts, typically about two to five transcripts. And you will analyze these transcripts and we'll talk about the process of analysis in future sessions. Um, that analysis assignment can be done in groups of up to three students, but the individual interview assignment you must do by yourself. Um, but once we get to the analysis stage, then you can do that in groups uh, or you can do it individually. That's your choice. So your interview assignment will be a semi-structured interview uh, and that is where there's a guide provided, but you also can adapt. As you're going through the interview, you can adapt the guide. So the guide is provided on eClass as part of the assignment instructions. And it provides several areas of broad questions for you to explore in relation to this experience of environmental studies and environmental activism question, broad research question that you're engaging in. So you should use this guide in your discussion, but you can, can and should allow this discussion to flow like a conversation. You can cover topics as they come up. You're not required to ask the questions in the order that they're presented in the guide. You can kind of move around depending on what this, the, the person is talking about at the particular time. And you also can probe into the questions, expand on the questions and the answers that you're getting in order to really get a rich discussion and rich data. So the guide provides a focus, um, but your interview should be flexible and adaptable as semi-structured interviews are. And I should note that semi-structured interviews typically are the most common type of interview that we use in qualitative research because they provide structure, they ensure that we're uh, delving into the specific questions that we have, but they allow for adaptability and they allow for new questions to come up. So let's talk about how we do interviews and how we do them well. 
Well, the first stage in interviewing is actually before we even conduct the interview, we need to negotiate the setting up of the interview. And so there's actually a lot of preparation done. And uh, the better your preparation, the better your interview is going to be. Um, and recruitment is actually really the beginning of the interview. You need to establish who you're going to interview, and then you need to establish a space to do that interview, a time and a place and a context, a physical or uh, other context which you're going to engage in this discussion. Um, and this could and often does take several back and forth kind of exchanges before you get to the actual moment of conducting the interview. Um, so you have to decide at a good time, you have to really think ahead of time about what, what might make that the most effective time and space to have this discussion, and then you usually have to remind the participant right before you're going to uh, go and do the interview um, and make sure that they're going to show up and, and really kind of uh, set up a structure that allows you to get together and do this interview. Now for your assignment for the class, we do suggest that you interview someone who is in your tutorial group for this class um, because that's the small group space where you're engaging directly with students. Um, but I do know that as a cohort you have uh, lots of peers in this program and you may uh, have done projects within the past or may know very well. So you can interview someone who's not in your tutorial group, but it does have to be someone who's currently enrolled in our class in EMBS or 3010. Um, so it does have to be someone who's currently in our class just to make things a little bit more simple. So. I mentioned that uh, the interview guide is particularly important, especially for a semi-structured interview, and it's very important that you know your guide really well. So before conducting a qualitative interview, you really want to review the guide and get a really good sense of it and kind of commit as much as possible um, the main questions to memory or at least make sure you know what the interview is seeking to engage in. Um, the more you do that, the more you're going to be able to have a really responsive discussion in your, in your interview. And uh, you're not having to be constantly going back to look at the questions and say, uh, what am I supposed to be asking here? Um, if, you can, if you can know your guide really well, uh, then you're going to get into a much more deep and rich discussion uh, and really generate a dialogue and a conversation. Now again, for the interview assignment, uh, you have been provided a semi-structured interview guide. The, this guide is again on eClass. You can find it, which goes into these different areas of environmental activism and, uh, and particular probes and particular specific areas of environmental act activism that gives you a general uh, way to approach the discussion. You should read this guide very carefully and you should also make notes on this guide that speak to you personally. There may be questions that are particularly of interest to you. Um, and there may be areas within those questions that you particularly want to focus on or think are particularly relevant. So this is your guide to adapt, as I've mentioned a couple of times, this is an adaptive process uh, to really engage in an interview that's going to speak to you and that's going to speak to your participant or your interviewee. So you also need to know your participant really well. In qualitative research, it's really important to do this background understanding of who we're going to interview. Obviously, we've identified these people for a particular reason, um, but we can also read up on who they are. We might be able to access some work or other kinds of things that they engage in. Um, uh, they may, there may be uh, uh, some, some, some stuff posted in online or things that they've written that give us a sense of, of, of who they are and, and why we want to talk to them. Um, and we can also consult literature or other documents related to the community they belong to. So uh, that might be of interest to us. We might be interested in a specific age range, like adolescents or the elderly. We may be interested in a specific cultural group or people who identify with a particular social or lived experience. So obviously there's going to be information about that group that we could access as well to get a sense of um, what is uh, relevant and timely in relation to these experiences. So coming back again to the interview assignment, you should reflect on who this person is and what you know about them, if anything, that you can bring to this discussion. Um, so you may, uh, you may know already some of the environmental activism that they're engaged in or, or expressed interest on that could be help bring richness to the discussion. If you don't know anything about that in relation to this person, that's just fine. You do know that you have a shared identity as a student at York University, um, and uh, likely this person is also in environmental studies. Um, so, you know, you do bring some understanding and you can build from there. 
It's also important that you know your setting when you're interviewing. So you need to know the questions you want to ask very well. You need to know the people and why you're asking them. And then you need to know the setting and the context in which the interview is taking place. Because an interview is an embodied interaction, even if you're doing it in a, in a, um, you know, in a teleconference, which we will be because of COVID, um, it's still an attraction, a real-time interaction between two people. So you want to be able to set up a space that is, uh, you know, uh, limiting distractions, um, providing you uh, with an ability to focus in on the conversation, um, providing some, uh, at least uh, uh, some kinds of privacy. If it's not full privacy, then at least, uh, you know, a, a private enough space that allows people you to really engage in this discussion. Um, and then there might be some things that you want to bring to the interview to make the person more comfortable, like water or tissues, if you think there's going to be emotions that come up. Um, just, just think about how you can really create a, a, a space that is welcoming and comfortable for the participant. Now again, as I just mentioned, for your interview assignment uh, due to COVID ongoing physical distancing, you will need to conduct the interview uh, via a teleconferencing or a telephone if that's your preference. Um, the easiest uh, would be to be using your York Zoom account. And it is also important, of course, because you want to transcribe this interview that you record it, that you audio record it. So the Zoom account function um, does have an, a record function that allows you to audio record the, the discussion. And obviously for this interview, um, we, will, uh, we will be allowing those kinds of recordings and we will be getting a consent to audio record, um, which I will talk about in a few minutes, which mirrors the consent processes we talked about last week. But no matter what technology you're using, if for some reason you decide not to use Zoom, you do need to make sure you have a reliable recording function and that you check the quality of the recording before you begin the interview. So that is a key part, is to make sure you get a good recording of your interview. So let's talk about doing the interview once you've set it all up. There is an art and a real practice to good interviewing. And you've probably all heard interviews through media or perhaps documentary films um, that you felt were very good and others that maybe you felt were not so good. So think about what makes a really good interview. And we have some tips for interviewing from this week's readings. Um, from the Jacob and Ferguson reading, we have a series of tips for how to ensure that you get a strong um, and effective interview. Um, so you want to, again, know your interview guide and perhaps start with a general script that will help you get the interview rolling. It, it, it helps to have a general sense of what you're going to say at the beginning and the end of an interview. And then the middle can be a little bit more freestyle, but uh, it sometimes helps to have a, you know, a, real, a real sort of set up script for the beginning. Then you want to make sure that you collect consent before you begin asking and recording the interview questions. So you might open the interview with a short description about what you're about to discuss. And then you need to make sure before you get in, into any data collection that you complete the consent process. As we talked about last week, it's important that we do a very clear and obvious and informed process of assent, consent upfront um, before we begin the process of the research. Um, so you get the consent procedures, you go over the principles of consent, um, you talk about and answer any questions the participant may have, talk about what you're going to do in this research process, and then you can confirm consent via uh, signature, or in this case, if you're recording, then you can have the person state th their consent, um, um, and then you begin the data collection. So you can go over the consent process, ensure that there's no questions, and then you can begin recording. And, and you can have them say, yes, I consent, if you want to get their consent on the audio tape. And then you can begin answering the questions. But you don't want to hit record until you've gone over that discussion of consent um, and confirmed consent, um, because uh, you want it to be very clear that when you're beginning the data collection. Um, and you do want to check twice before you begin recording, or when you begin recording, to make sure you are recording. So there is nothing worse than conducting a great interview and at the very end you find out that your recording uh, didn't start or stopped halfway. So be attentive and that requires a little bit of juggling um, throughout your interview to make sure that the recording is happening. Obviously if you're doing this on Zoom it's, it's a little bit more straightforward because you can see right in front of you the recording um, sort of um, function and the red button is still lit up. Um, but uh, definitely take a second 
uh, a really kind of coherent second at the beginning of your interview to ensure that the recording has started. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, you want to make sure you have a good space for the interview, that you have enough time for the interview, and that you can focus in with genuine care and concern uh, for this person you are interviewing. Um, and again, the more preparation you can do and the more you can bring a real active listening and genuine care approach to the interview, the better your interview is going to be. Um, we're going to talk in a couple of seconds on my, as I move through this, this, this talk uh, about how to engage in active listening and some key principles of that. Um, and so once uh, you've done this wonderful interview where you've done this really good active listening and generated a good, a good discussion and some really good data, you do want a plan for how you're going to end the interview. Um, so that again, that can be a script that you have prepared or sort of a, a process that you know that's going to wrap up the interview. And you also want to give yourself some time once the interview is completed and the interviewee has, 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 has left, um, you want to give yourself some time to write some field notes directly after completing the interview. Um, so don't be running off to another class or something else that you need to do. Give yourself some space to sit down and write some field notes because it's going to be then at, right after you've conducted the interview when you have the strongest impressions from the interview um, and that if you jot those down uh, those can be very helpful for when you're getting to analysis. So you want to write down some of the key things that came up, um, some of the most relevant and interesting parts of the discussion, any other contextual things that happened throughout and perhaps even say you know there was a really good answer halfway through or three quarters of the way through and I want to make sure I go back to some key moments in the interview when I'm doing my analysis. Now let's come back to the interview assignment. You, as I mentioned there is an ethics process that uh, we have actually had approved so, through the York Research Ethics Board so um, because this is actual qualitative research that you're going to be engaged in. We did go through an ethics process. Um, we had our protocol reviewed and has been approved um, for you to do this research, including a consent process. So there is a consent form on eClass that's available as part of the assignment materials um, that you need to be familiar with, that you will be providing to the participant and you will be going through this consent process with them. I think they, we even though we're doing this over uh, over teleconferencing, I think that they should sign the consent form and email it back to you. But you can also go through over this verbally during the uh, teleconference um, and ensure that they have um, that the principles of consent are followed. We will discuss this form in more detail at our lecture, the, our Zoom lecture this coming Monday. But there is a consent process that you will need to go through and have your interviewee sign. And then there's also a confidentiality form that you will need to sign. Um, and this is a form committing that you, as an interviewer, will respect the anonymity and confidentiality of your interviewee. So obviously you know who they are, but you're not going to provide their name or any contact or identifiable information in the transcript and in the paper that you're writing about this interview. And if they share anything with you, you're going to keep that confidential. You're not going to go off and start talking to other classmates or other people about what they have said. Um, so uh, that's a form that you will need to sign to con commit to this uh, process of confidentiality and, and anonymizing the data once you get it. There is also a demographic form or some demographic questions that we want you to ask your interviewee. And this is so we can create a data set that um, lets us understand who has been interviewed. And so there's a, a, a series of questions, short uh, five qu questions, um, that uh, are, are also found on this Google form. Um, and you will complete uh, these questions. You can, what you can do is you can just ask these questions to your participant. And then you can go on the form and type in the answers. Um, and, and upload the demographics that way. And the form link to the form is also provided in the assignment details. Um, so again, we'll have a chance to discuss all of this uh, on the Zoom session uh, this coming Monday, uh, but this is uh, another process that you'll need to complete as part of your interview to, to uh, generate the demographics for the interviews. So let's talk about how to conduct really good interviews. Um, you want to Definitely make sure the audio is recording and check that a few times throughout the interview. You also want to be 
attentive to time and ask one question at, the t at a time. You want to give a lot of space for answers and not rush the interview. Uh, it's quite important that you provide a lot of space um, and that you, uh, you, you probe into the answers and I'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. Um, and you also want to try to remain as neutral as possible, although you can be personal in the interview. You don't have to be a person with no sort of reactions or opinions, but you don't want to pass judgment on anything that people are saying. So you can indicate understanding. You may even very briefly say, oh, that's something I've experienced as well, or I really understand why you might ha have that perspective. Um, you don't want to dominate the do conversation, but you can sometimes encourage people by by providing an understanding response, but you definitely don't want to judge uh, the responses one way or the other. So you want to encourage dialogue, um, but not dominate dialogue, and definitely be neutral in relation to the discussion. And this is all the art of active listening, the art of interviewing. And active listening is really an important element that requires patience and more, and listening with more than one's ears. Uh, so tuning into the whole person, um, and giving them a lot of space to answer questions uh, and really kind of connecting to the way that they're feeling and how they're engaging in the discussion, both their answers but also their body language and really um, ensuring that you're focusing in very, very deeply on this individual. Uh, everybody's experienced what it's like to be paid attention to and to have a rich discussion and the principles of doing that really well are obviously the kinds of skills that's going to make you a good interviewer. So you had a little video to watch this week that's on eClass that talks about active listening, which is a skill for life, really, not just a skill for research. Um, and, it, and it brought up some, some good tips for how to be a really good active listener. So stay focused, and this can be through eye contact. Um, uh, you know, if you're not in person, sometimes the eye contact thing can get a little bit more uh, awkward or, or challenging, um, but you know we've all spent a lot of time uh, on on Zoom or other kinds of teleconferencing these days. So you know how to do that in a natural way to make sure the person uh, feels that you're paying attention to them, and also to really be patient and give them a lot of space. So uh, really listen, avoid thinking about what you're going to say next. Try to really really focus in on what they're saying right now, rather than jumping forward in your head about okay how do I respond to this. And also allow for silence, which is really a big part of conducting good interviews. Um, wait, even if it seems like a little bit too long for the person to answer the question, because we've probably all, all experienced this. Sometimes it takes time to formulate an answer. Sometimes you're, you're kind of jumping around in your head, figuring out how you're going to begin answering a question. And, and there's a little bit of a pause between the question and the answer. So if a person hasn't answered right away, really give a, a few more seconds to let that answer come forward. Um, if it doesn't come forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some ways that you can kind of bring it forward um, and sort of generate the conversation. Um, and then once you are getting into a response, you want to paraphrase back to the person, sort of very briefly summarizing their words or ideas back to them. I hear you saying this. This is, the, this is what I'm understanding from what you're saying. Um, to reassure them that you're really listening and also to encourage more, more opening up, more deeply uh, engaging with what they're trying to say. And that's paraphrasing back not just the words that they're saying, but also the emotions. So you don't have to be... You could be neutral while also engaging with some emotion. So you don't have to be a sort of a robot. You could be someone who's very empathetic um, and, and sort of giving back emotion um, while you're listening. Um, so you're using words and emotion to express back what you're hearing. And as I mentioned, silence is one of the great arts of both conversation and of listening and in, in that way of interviewing. So good qualitative interviewers need to learn to get comfortable with silences. And this is really about not jumping in too quickly to fill in a silence. Uh, I think we've been taught in our very rapid modern environments that silence is uncomfortable and that we need to fill it. Uh, we need to provide the answer. Um, but that is really kind of the uh, opposite of what you're really trying to do because you want to uh, prioritize the voice of the participants. So you want to use your voice less so that their voice can come out. And Dilly, on the other reading for this week, talks about how 
interviewers should really seek to talk about 20% of the time and listen about 80% of the time. And that can be hard to do. And it doesn't necessarily mean your interview is not a good interview if you end up with a slightly different ratio. But it is a good rule of thumb to think about how can I really dial what I'm saying back so that I give a lot of space for the data that I'm looking for from this participant. And Dilly talks about concepts of multiple voices. Um, so there's 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 a need to listen, and there's also a need to uh, a need to compare back what is being said by this participant, by this interviewee, to the background work that you've done, um, and to the knowledge that is uh, is out there in relation to this topic. Uh, and at the same time, there's the, the there's sort of the process of time that's going on. So you have a lot to juggle in interviewing. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do because you want to really listen carefully. You want to be attentive to what's being said so that you can compare it to the things that you know about this already. And you also want to offer insights to prompt reflection uh, or to gain clarification. This is your moment to say, okay, I don't really understand... Uh, can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Or can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, because once that person is no longer in front of you, that's going to be harder to get clarifications or further explications. So, so you have, you know, you have this need to listen really well, but also probe a little bit into what is being said. And at the same time, you want to make sure that you're using time well, and that you're not spending too much time on one question and not getting to further questions that you also think are important. But th having said that, Sometimes we end up in a discussion with somebody and we can tell from the way the interview is unfolding that they're going to be able to provide some really deep insight into a particular question in, in the guide you see something on climate change. And if this is a person who's done a lot of work on climate change, you might want to spend a lot of time in the interview on that question. That might mean some of the other questions are not covered as in-depthly. And that can be okay. Sometimes a good interview is about delving deeply into the thing that is really emerging as, uh, as the important topic in this interview. But you also want to have a sense of, of the fact that you want to, to cover multiple questions, that there's a reason for the additional questions. So it's a balancing act. It's, it's, it's very much that sort of adaptive process where you, through the discussion, uh, you kind of juggle the way that you're going to navigate through this discussion to get into some rich uh, qualitative data collection. So how do you kind of open and generate a really deep conversation? This is where the art of qualitative research and inter qualitative interviewing in particular is really about using open-ended questions and probes that help us get an open-ended conversation. So if you have this exchange where you get a really brief kind of general answer to your question and you know that's that's not telling you a lot of things, how do you get deeper into the actual data, the actual content, the actual insights that you're looking for? Well, these this is where you use the concept of probing. So in qualitative research, probing means to delve deeper and to uncover more deeply the answers to the questions that are coming up. Um, and so it involves asking follow-up questions to get further at the information that you're looking for or that is, 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 is coming forward in the conversation. So here's a list of questions you can use to do that. So in response to a question like a generalized um, answer to the question that's not very informative, you can delve more deeply by using questions like, could you please tell me more about X, Y, Z? Could you elaborate? Could you give me some examples? And then you can also use probes that reflect back in that active listening kind of strategy. What I hear you saying is, what, 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 uh, what, what I'm getting from you is, can you tell me if, that's, if, uh, if I'm getting that correctly? Um, and you can also ask things like, what made you feel this way? Or why did you make that decision? Or why is that important to you? You can ask about barriers. You can ask about uh, enabling experiences. You can ask questions that help them get further into um, telling of that experience and their insights. So Dilly also tells us that good interviewing is kind of, it eludes a sort of a specific definition. It's not the kind of thing where you could say there's a formula for it uh, or there's a particular recipe for it, but we know it when we see it. And, it. and it's really something that feels opening, that we're generating insights. It's again, like a really good conversation. There's, there's feelings of excited uh, sort of opening that happens, like something is, something, something is happening that's providing insight. 
but interviews can also be challenging and it may involve navigating some unexpected things. Uh, sometimes there's weirdness in an interview, just like there can be weirdness in any human interaction. Sometimes for whatever reason, you're not connecting with the person. Um, sometimes you or they may be uncomfortable or sometimes maybe they're getting a little too comfortable and you're not sure how to balance, uh, you know, a, 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 an overly friendliness um, with the kinds of questions that you're asking. Um, and, you know, it, sometimes we need to just kind of let it be uncomfortable and then move through that. And usually those moments uh, are things that we can overcome and get into better discussion. Um, so, you know, if there's a bit of discomfort, don't let that shut you down. Try to move through that and start asking these probing questions. And then um, hopefully you will get more into a, a, a comfortable flow of conversation. Um, and sometimes there can be conflict. I, I trust that in our context of, of the interview for this class that your cohort is really a respectful one um, and that, uh, uh, you know, conflict will be avoided or very minimized. Um, but, you know, depending on the research you're doing, sometimes conflict can come up. And uh, if you know that you're engaging in research that has a likelihood of generating uh, uh, some kind of conflicting emotions or discussion, you should probably have a plan for how you're going to manage that. Um, and in general, uh, you know, research is usually engaged in something that is trying, trying to provide specific insights. And sometimes those insights involve asking questions that have, that are going to generate emotions. Uh, usually we're interested in something for a reason and that reason has a depth to it. And that reason in involves emotion. Um, so you may have powerful emotional experiences and expressions that come out of interviews. People may cry. People may uh, uh, share experiences that are very uh, emotional for them to talk about. Um, and so, you know, coming into the space in a way that you can honor and affirm these experiences is really important. And maybe even just being prepared for the fact that emotion might be expressed and, and, uh, and making sure, sure you're in a headspace to not shut down that or not feel intimidated by that. Um, because emotion can generate some really important insights. It is, of course, really important to honor participants in relation to how much they want to reveal um, and, and also if they've shared something emotional and you've got some good stuff happening and then it's clear to you that they've, they've, they're tired and they're done with the discussion to honor, you know, where they're at in relation to having this discussion. Um, but don't let emotion shut you down completely. Definitely go with it, but definitely be respectful of how far you should go and when you should also know when to, when, when, when things need to wrap up. So it is important to be attentive to how you're going to end your interview and to get a feeling. And often this is a natural, sort of a, a natural moment that kind of seems like, you know, the, it is coming to an end. Um, uh, I think we've all probably been engaged in situations where uh, we were really deep in the middle of something and then we can feel like, okay, it, it's moving through and you can sense that it's time to wrap up. So, um, you know, you want to ask yourself, do you have what you need? Did you get good answers to some of your key questions? And again, sometimes this means you've covered some things very in depth um, and maybe other things not as much. Or, you know, it could even mean that there's a question or two that you haven't covered at all. Um, but that you want to ensure that you have some really good insights and that you've captured some relevant data to some of the uh, research interests, if not every single one of the questions. Um, but of course, you also want to consider your participants, as I was just saying. So you want to make sure they've had space to fully express themselves. And you also want to be tuned in if they're fading, um, you know, tune into any cues that this is really time to wrap up. And have a plan, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, for the ending. So have a debriefing script. Have a question, is there anything else I should know? Um, do you feel that we've covered everything of relevance here? Uh, do you have any questions for me before we close? Um, make sure that it's clear that you're coming to an end in the interview and give them space to, um, to engage in that ending. And then ensure that you do any final, clo final closing procedures that need to be done. This is likely, if you're going to provide an honoraria, probably the moment that you're going to give them that honoraria. Um, as we discussed last week, some, sometimes in ethical processes, we want to provide additional supports. If, we, if, if we've talked about something that's sensitive, we may want to give them links to anonymized chat lines or things that they can talk 
with about with other people if if this has brought up emotions that they want to work through so sometimes we we have an imperative to do that or that's part of our ethics process so we may provide some kind of uh, uh you know some kind of information on supports to that person at the end of an interview often it's a piece of paper with some some website links or some phone numbers that they can follow up with if they want to um and then you also want to be respectful of this person perhaps you want to show them the way to the elevator if you're doing this in, in or the the how how to leave the space if you're doing this in person uh, and really just kind of like close with that with a respectful ending to the interview and as i mentioned you also want to provide some space once the interview is completed and you're no longer in that discussion and the interviewee the person you've interviewed has uh, left the space um, that you write some field notes um, and you, too often we avoid this or like we, we don't get in this step. We, uh, not avoid it, but we just don't give ourselves time for it because we're busy and we have something else to do. And we think I'll do this later, but it's really powerful to write field notes as soon as you've completed the interview. Um, you may write additional notes later on. If you're doing analysis, you're probably going to be doing a lot of note taking during your analysis, but the initial notes are going to help you with that analysis. They're going to, you're going to remember the feelings and impressions you had when your interview had just ended. Um, but you also want to write down what were the key things that came out of this interview, especially if you're going to do multiple interviews for your assignment, you're just going to do one interview. But usually in qualitative research, we don't just do one interview, we do several interviews. And so, you know, all those interviews are going to be kind of all me meshed together in your brain once you've completed them all. So when you can go back to your notes, you'll be like, okay, right, that was the person who talked about that. And you can, you can have a map for how to approach your analysis. So writing up detailed impressions, writing up some key things about what the, what the interview talked about, some key insights, maybe what surprised you, if something uncomfortable or emotional did come up, uh, maybe noting that can be really useful to go back to uh, once you do begin your interview analysis. And you may also want to have a plan, and it's always a good idea to do so, uh, especially again if you're engaging in research that really does delve into some sensitive topics. You want to have a plan if you need to debrief with someone. So interviews can be very emotional for the person who's being interviewed, but they can also be very emotional for the person doing the interview, the interviewer. Um, it, you know, it can bring things up or it can be challenging to have an emotional discussion and hold space for that discussion. Um, and so you, 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 even before you begin conducting interviews, uh, should think about who you would want to debrief with. Uh, perhaps you have a friend or a supervisor uh, or some colleague uh, involved in, in, in the same context as you uh, that you can talk about. But of course, if you do do these debriefs and, and you know, it's important to do your own self-care, you do also want to be very attentive to the confidentiality and anonymity um, procedures that um, are going to be very important. So obviously you can talk about experiences and talk about the issues that came up without revealing the individual. Um, and you have to be very careful when you have these discussions that you talk mostly about what was difficult for you or, or what, what the ideas or the insights that were generated you want to debrief on, but not share things that are going to uh, breach the confidentiality of this interview, which is of course imperative in this, in this kinds of research and in research in general. So for your interview assignment, uh, you will complete this interview with someone from the class and then you will transcribe the interview and then you will write a short reflection paper about the whole experience. So again, this is an individual paper that you complete yourself, not in groups. And in this paper, you will compare and contrast uh, the experience of doing the interview and you will take up the course readings to do so. So you'll talk about challenges of the interview, what was really great about it, uh, you know, so successes and challenges, um, and also write, a, reflect a little bit about what is the most memorable part of the interview, what you really learned from this interview, and also what you might do differently, because every time we do an interview, we learn about how to do the next one better. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you saw this person again, if you followed up with them, what, what questions might you ask uh, now that you've had a chance to reflect on what came up in the interview? Um, and in general, uh, what would you repeat in future if you're doing more qualitative data collection using interviews, um, what would you do differently? So this is your chance to build your skills in interviewing um, by doing an interview, uh, engaging with the course readings related to how to do interviews well, and also reflecting on your experience to build your skill set. So 
checklist of the assignment. You will recruit a fellow student, you will do a consent process with them, then you will record an interview using the interview guide, you will transcribe the interview. We have a session on transcription um, in our, our next class where we will go deeply into how to do a good transcription, and then you will write a short reflection paper um, on the whole experience, referencing the course readings. Uh, we will talk at our Zoom lecture this Monday um, about assignment expectations. We'll have a chance to answer any questions and get a little bit more in, into the as assignment details. But, uh, but yes, this is the general overview of the interview assignment. And so for this week, um, as we wrap up, uh, you know, we've talked about tips and techniques for conducting good research and good qualitative interviews. And I want to bring up and open the idea of uh, other considerations that we need to bring into research. We talked briefly about this in relation to ethics, um, but what is the context and the power dynamics that we might need to really tap into when we're thinking about research? And so I'm going to introduce you to some ideas that we're going to further unpack in subsequent sessions of the course. And a key part of this, or a key idea or concept here is the notion of reflexivity. So who are you, you as an individual in all of this work? What does your positionality and your social location have to do with the research? And how is it going to influence the research? How is it going to inform and, uh, and sort of impact the research that you're engaging in? Being reflexive means thinking about our own role in a research encounter. How does who we are influence the results that we're going to get? How do our preconceived notions, ideas, and experience bring insight or, or color the research? Um, so it means thinking about where you're positioned in relation to this research. Uh, that's about social location, um, you know, how you identify and how the, the person you're interviewing will identify you. Um, but also thinking about what might be some unconscious biases that you need to surface, uh, reflecting on, um, you know, the, the, the opinions and beliefs and experiences that you bring to these research questions. Um, and uh, making sure that you tap into the idea that your, your questions, your memories of the research, the field notes that you write about the research are not going to be objective. As we've discussed in qualitative research, we really believe that we are subjectively implicated in the research that we're doing. Um, so this process of research reflexivity is a deliberate process where the researcher makes a conscious effort to interrogate their subjective self in relation to the research subject. Uh, and uh, you may have talked about reflexivity in other classes. I suspect that you probably have, but these are kind of big ideas to unpack. And so I want to introduce this to you in the context of this course, and we will have a chance to discuss this several times through our, our, uh, our Zoom sessions. Um, in particular, and, and also I think we will begin this discussion next week, so I, I will bring some questions to you in relation to reflexivity and in relation to um, qualitative research um, on our next Zoom session this coming Monday. So yeah, reflexivity is about thinking about the perspectives and perhaps even the, the, the biases that you bring um, and how these might influence the research um, and the contextual and subjective underpinnings of qualitative research that call us uh, to recognize that we are very much part of the context and have influence on the research that we're doing. Uh, so yeah. I, my plan for the Zoom lecture session, our interactive lecture session on Monday, is to talk more about the assignment expectations, give you a chance to uh, engage with any questions that you might have in relation to the upcoming uh, interview assignment, and then also get into, in the second half of our hour together on Monday, uh, uh, begin a discussion about reflexivity. And of course, as I've highlighted, um, your quiz number one is uh, starting this week. So the, the course quizzes are starting this week. And there is a quiz which will open uh, Wednesday, January 20th at 8 p.m., um, which will be 10 multiple choice true or false questions, or multiple choice or true. It's a mix of multiple choice and true or false questions, which are based on this video lecture. Um, and the readings that you're meant to do for this week. So you'll have the quiz. It'll open uh, um, shortly after I post this video at 8 p.m. Wednesday, January 20th, and it will close on Monday, January 25th at 11 a.m. And a reminder that um, 
we will only use the scores from your top eight quizzes. So there, we will drop one of your scores. So we will drop the lowest score. Um, so if for whatever reason you're having a week where the quiz is not something you can engage with, you have one week where you will not be, uh, we will drop the lowest score, uh, whatever that score is of, of your quiz. So you do have a one quiz week or just, yeah, just to remind you that we will be only using the scores of your top eight quizzes and dropping your lowest score. Okay, uh, I think that is uh, where I will wrap it for today and look forward to our discussion next Monday.